I am very honored to be with Jennifer Grant, Marketing Manager for Heisel Global Europe. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. Thank you very much. Today, um, we're going to talk about an interesting company in China, uh, Heisel. Um, and just to just get started, I want to get the um, just the skinny on what this company is. Um, what do you guys do? And, and then I'll, I'll talk a little about, about what you do. Yeah, sure. So I work for a company called Heisel. So we're um, an online platform where we match make buyers with suppliers worldwide. So whether you're in Europe or in North America, you can essentially hop onto our platform and be paired with um, a supplier or manufacturer that fits your project and requirements, whether that's a metal or plastic part or a project. Um, so it could be any kind of product and it can be from prototype to full scale production. So it just eliminates the need to travel and also eliminates the need to pre-vet factories yourself. Yeah. So it's um, some, some of the stuff is, is, high production, high volume, and some of it is is even just like a, a one-off piece, correct? Exactly that. So it can be one-off pieces or it can be full-scale production. So we have the capacity to, to tailor for both. So that's what makes it so special because a lot of companies that have minimum order quantities. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking to produce one or two parts, it's not cost-effective to use a platform. So you're a matchmaker for buyers and suppliers. Um, and my understanding is there's two services you guys have. You have Heisel Global and Heisel.com. Can you explain the two differences between those? Exactly. Yes. So Heisel.com would be the matchmaker essentially. So where anyone from anywhere in the world can come online and they can actually request for a quote from a supplier. And within 24 hours, um, suppliers that fit the criteria and who are able to deal with the project can quote. Um, and then essentially the buyer can come on and filter by different filters such as certifications, location, um, capacity, number of employees, um, the research and development department of that factory. So they can factor on what aspects are relevant for them. Whereas at Heisel Global, we are directly the manufacturers. So this is essentially completely stress-free and a hands-off experience where we would take the project um, from scratch. Um, our manufacturers and engineers would deal with it and then essentially will end up at, at the door of the buyer. So really but Heisel, 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 okay, they have their own, their own machines, their own factories, but they're not, they're outsourcing it too, correct? Some? So- it depends. It depends on the project, not always. So we do have in-house capacity. Um, so essentially it really depends on a project by project basis. Um, and it would all be talked through with them. They would have an account manager who would uh, be working with the buyer closely throughout the whole from start to finish. Give me a rough, uh, a rough idea of how much of Heisel Global is outsourced to other shops versus um, they have their own capacity to to do it and and their own capacity is inside other shops correct it's like they'll have a corner of some other factory where it's their machines and they're doing the work so um i don't have the percentages per se because that's actually not my department so once a project comes into us our team and the um our account managers will deal with that and it will head off to our engineer department. So they will essentially look at the design and decide where to send this, who's going to produce this. And it's all hands off for the buyer. So whether it's produced by Heisel themselves or they outsource, um, the buyer literally does, does nothing and is not sure. involved. So it's normally that they get a sample. And then once they've approved the sample, we can go into full scale production. So the that option is a lot more popular than the matchmaking option yes it's not that one option is more popular than the other it really depends on how much time the buyer wants to put in a lot of the companies who want to spend time elsewhere would choose Heisel Global because 
this is hands off. So they have the time to run their business essentially. Sure. And you don't need to keep going back and forth with the factory, highs on manage everything for you. So it really depends what kind of experience you're looking for, how big your company is, how much time you have. Um, and if you want to be the hands-on person to negotiate and um, do your quality checks, um, Hyzord does all of that. So it's almost a secondary, the, the factory themselves will quality check, but then Hyzord, if they've outsourced it, will quality check themselves as well. So okay. you, you know, it's really, really hands-off basically. But if you Hyzord do, if the, you do the matchmaking thing, then it's basically Heisel makes the match. They get the two, the vendor and the customer in, in touch. And then it's just totally hands off for Heisel. They don't help with language or communication between the two companies, or whatever. It's just, this is the initial match. And then you're on your own. Am I right? Not, not at all. So they do help. So we are on hand to help with that, which is another reason to use a platform like Heisel rather than go at it alone, because we are there on hand. So obviously speaking the native language, we can help with negotiation. We can help with any language barriers, any questions that they have. So yeah, we're always on hand. Um, but it is essentially the supplier and buyer directly. But Heisel are on hand, yes. Okay. Is it going to be more expensive for one than the other or it just depends on the job and really depends on the job because with the um, heisel global you'll get one quote which is from heisel with heisel.com you might get five six seven ten plus quotes from different suppliers all different prices but you have to um, choose depending on different criteria um, so it really really does depend but with heisel.com you would get a variety of quotes and it'll be up to you to decide which one to go for, which one's best suited to your project. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really interesting. It just seems like I, it's scary uh, to, you know, I, I understand, I guess that it's, the point is to make it a little less scary to go to China. Um, but the problem I see is if you're just talking to, this one company that's the one-stop shop and they're going to do it all, although they're doing it all for you, it seems kind of scary to just kind of go hands off and um, it's just like, here you go. Um, but there's, there's a lot of communication between them so exactly exactly so we have a portal and uh, it gives real-time information so at any point obviously you get the dedicated account manager you can drop them a message um, you'll be getting regular updates and also you can hop into the system and see real time where your project is up to so you're not kind of kept in the dark and then it just turns up you're informed the whole way but to the degree you want to be you might not want any updates you might just want this is the date i need it to arrive by highs i'll ensure that that happens um, because a lot of times factories can give you a lead time and say, okay, it's going to be delivered to you in three weeks, but then there's delays, 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 and you, that might be really important for you. So with Heisel, you say, I need it for X day. We will ensure it, it's arriving by that day. So this is all. How can you ensure it? So we will be managing the project. It's all about being on the ground, essentially. We are where the factories are um, and we are making sure that things run run smoothly and keeping that pressure on and just obviously there's some circumstances where a delay can't be helped you know sure. um, but you maximize your chances of having the lead time um come through for you basically yeah yeah, yeah. obviously with covid and the delays and um, during covid with logistics and delivery um this was a hard time for all companies you know absolutely so, Extraneous circumstances aside, um, Heisel is a good way to ensure that, you know, things are done on time. Mm -hmm. It sounds a little bit like uh, Zometry. We did an interview with them and, and Thomas Net. It's, it's sort of a similar concept. You, you submit the drawing. Give me, give me a, um, just a brief synopsis of like the whole process. So they go online, they find Heisel or Heisel Global, and then what does a company do after that? They call, do they just, yep. can it be done all online? Yep. So once you found Heisel, whether that's direct or referral, we have a lot of referrals from customers who have 
um, had a good experience with us. You would, if you're on hyazor.com, you would submit your request for quotation. So you would apply for a request for quote um, and do it all online. You can sign an NDA and have them sign an NDA as well. And literally it's all done from your online account, which you can create in two minutes. Um, so you put all your project requirements and your design, and then it goes through to the suppliers. And before it does, Heisel have a team of engineers that actually pre vets your request for quote to check, is there anything more that needs to be added? Right, is everything course. there that they need? That makes total sense because you don't know who who's submitting it, if they know what the heck they're talking about or not. And um, I, I, I have a little difficulty with the idea of this NDA and somebody just pops their, their drawing in on on the web um to go to likely go to a source in china no less and yeah there's jennifer oh there you go yeah so there's i mean it's it's putting your it's submitting your drawing and having it go to a company that's it's based in china right Heisel? Wait, you're, I can't hear you. Yes, oh. exactly. So the NDA is valid um, and it's a standard one that's accepted worldwide. So it's not specific to China or any country. And you can, you can actually, if you have your own NDA, you can also upload that. So if you weren't happy with Heisel's templates, you yeah. can actually upload your own company one and have them sign it. It just seems um, like difficult because an NDA, maybe in the United States, you could sue somebody for it. But if somebody violates your trust, steals your intellectual property. Is there really anything you can do? So in a sense, if, if I mean, there's all the, to some extent, there's always some risk, but yeah. using a big platform like Heisel is, is really your, your best minimizing that risk because we have already pre-vetted these factories, right. hundreds of millions, like thousands so it's, of customers. So, so what used. you're saying is, what you're saying is it's actually safer to use Heisel then go on your own and find a vendor in China. Hundred percent, because with Heisel, we have partnered with these factories for many years, and they've already had many customers go through them, and that's why they're still on our platform. And each factory actually has customer review, so after a project's finished, mm. a customer can actually review the factory. Cool. So if there were any, you know, negative experiences, you'd be able to see that before, and we would of course remove them from the platform. So in a way going at it alone you have no idea about the factory um or even wh where they are what their real capacity is whereas with heisel you don't have that unknown um yes so that's, right that's no i mean point. because china is just we're outsourcing it anywhere in general i mean it's scary you have no idea what the heck is going to happen um who you're dealing with and you still don't know but i mean i, I it seems like what you guys are doing is you're holding their hand and the language thing is a huge thing, right? Just, just communicating. 100%. It's one of the key things. It's one of the main things that prevents people outsourcing overseas to places like China is knowing that actually they can't communicate very well with the person, the manufacturer and the supplier. And um, a, a small misunderstanding in the project can cause big problems later on, especially if you're doing full scale production and you have even the tolerance slightly off or some misunderstanding with the drawing. Uh, it can be a huge cost wastage as well as time wastage. So it's, it's yeah. a big plus. What if somebody is using Heisel Global? So they're, they're outsourcing to sort of the one stop shop, not the matchmaker, and they want to go to China and see the process, can they? Can they go and observe the part actually being made and go to that shop? So of course they can. I mean, from our side, there's no restrictions on that. Um, I would say that at the moment, the last year or two and for the foreseeable, it's very difficult to visit China. Um, and again, the only issue would be probably the language barrier. Um, so it's no guarantee that the people in the factory directly will speak English. Heisel and, wouldn't um, wouldn't wouldn't meet somebody over there and be like, "Hey, I'll take um, you over there." And it would depend on it would depend on the project. You know, if it was for a prototype or if it was, it really does depend. But Heisel right. have done that in the past, yes. Yeah, so they, if they were making a hundred thousand a hundred thousand part run or a million part run, you know, 
it's yes i mean i don't have you know there's no exact number to but say a yes, significant we'll customer we they you they would let you come over and see it that's 100%. Cool. And this has this has happened in the past as well. We have had customers come and visit. We've taken them around a few factories so they can choose which one fits them. So depending on the size and scope of the project, um, this was pre-COVID, um, they would come over to China and that, that would exactly happen, yes. Interesting. Um, so what percentage of the stuff goes to China versus some of the other Asian countries? Um, it really depends. I don't have the specific quote on um, how much is outsourced to Asia. And it depends because production, um, for so example- So it's not during, all outsourced to Asia? I'm um, sorry, I meant other countries except China in Asia. Oh, okay. So um, during COVID, for example, there were some factories that closed down, some very specific factories. So if we had a quote for those factories coming in, we could outsource it to other countries within Asia. Um, so it really depends on the project. And this would be- um, the job of the engineers and the and the team who are responsible for sourcing within China who are on the ground. Um, what's special actually is our team have got over 25 years experience. They're very, very experienced in what they do. So they know exactly who to pair with and why and who will get it done the best, um, not just the fastest, but the highest quality. Um, so this isn't my forte, but um, what I can tell you is it's not really location that matters. It's the factory that matters and who's best suited sure. to the project. Sure, I, I I just find it interesting. I was just yeah. curious who has the infrastructure um, mm. to do the stuff. Um, I mean, would stuff is stuff going to Japan? Currently, we don't have any partners in Japan. No. Where are the partners? Thailand, Vietnam. So yes, we have Korea? some in Vietnam. Um, we have some in the Philippines. Mm. Um, mostly vietnam actually um the predominant number of our factories are within china um okay. most things can be done within china but it's good to know that we have a supply chain that reaches to other countries say for some reason one of the china facilities closed down mid project we can easily resource reallocate those resources elsewhere which is which is again something you don't get if you go direct you would have to then source somebody else yourself so you know uh a lot of places in the West, in Europe, in the United States, North America, they're saying there's reshoring happening. I don't know if there's actual reshoring, but you know, you do hear lots of companies are deciding they're going to just make it at home because the the supply chain is more difficult, things are less reliable. Um, have you guys gotten a hit from that, or? So no, not really. We haven't. And um, a lot of our customers are um, long term customers. And I think I understand there are some advantages to um, in house manufacturing and manufacturing within the country. Um, however, it does still remain that um, outsourcing is typically a much lower cost. And if you choose somebody well established like Heisel, the supply chain issues don't really um, affect as much as if you're going direct and outsourcing yourself, you kind of get these, these issues more. Um, so I mm -hmm. think that it's mitigated using a platform. Um, and it's essentially you're saving cost um, and saving time and you have access to manufacturing capabilities that you probably won't have within the country. Um, the level of tech, the speed it can go to market, all of this has to be considered as well. Um, you okay. know, highs all can, um, China manufacturing can bring stuff to market very, very quickly. So this is a huge plus. Sure. Um, which countries in the world uh, are using it the most? Um, United States, um, Britain, Germany? So we're very big across Europe. Um, probably the biggest audience would be in the US, but um, again, the US is much bigger, so um, it's all relative. But yes, we also um, are very big within Germany, the UK, Switzerland, Italy, France. Um, but the most, such... the most customers are in North America. The US, yeah, exactly, North America. How do people pay? for it um so variety of payment methods do you take Typically, cryptocurrency no we don't don't take cryptocurrency um 
However, you never know what the future holds. More and more companies are adopting this as a payment method. Sure. But um, at the moment, highs or don't. So typically it's bank transfer, just the standard old fashioned ways. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also the safest method. It's quite fast. Um, and we also offer part payments. So you pay in, in parts. Um, so you will pay a portion when you first sign the contract, then you'll pay a portion, maybe probably when the prototype has arrived, and then you can pay the remainder before full scale production. So it can be broken down. Um, there's a variety of payment options or displayed on the website. What do you see as the, as, as the, the future of the company, the growth where, what? Um, I see it growing from strength to strength. You know, it's not just COVID that's brought digital manufacturing, on-demand manufacturing to the forefront. It's So it's COVID has really helped you guys grow, oh, even though course, the supply chain problem, it's, it's 100%, helped you guys. Yeah, because previously people needed to go to China and now you don't need to travel. You can just stay at your desk in your home and, and be connected, be connected within half an hour, an hour to a manufacturer that suits you. And I think that this was growing with or without COVID, this was growing and becoming more of a thing because it's also about trust. You might not trust a, um, a platform in China to, to source for you, but now it's becoming a lot more mainstream. Quality of manufacturing in China has gone, uh, is a country mile better than a decade ago since um, yeah. China have so many different policies in place now for quality standards. The quality is extremely high. So we had the Made in China 2025 initiative, which is still ongoing. Um, there's What's been that? so many. So it's just an initiative that the government are running to improve the quality of of manufacturing um, throughout China. Oh. Um, and not only this, but you know now more people are accessing and outsourcing the factories have up their game anyway so it's, yeah. it's it's not comparable to say 10 years ago and once you get high quality from your prototype you'll use china for your full-scale production and then you'll just keep using um china for your your manufacturing so this is the way it's going yeah. and i mean I my my assumption is just that it's like anywhere there's there's great companies and then there's yeah no, of, co of course, of course. Rubbish ones, we, as you guys would yeah, say. Yeah, no, of course, yeah. Which is, again, why a platform is ideal, because we've already kind of sourced who are the best factories to partner with. We don't partner with just anybody. We actually how do they go find, to the how do you guys? How do you guys find the ones that uh, you think are good? Yeah, so there's a team that do this. So it's not, again, something I do. It's a team on the ground, um, and they specifically source factories they go to visit them, they pre-vet them on a range of topics, they go and physically see the factory, and then if it fits and if it's, you know, up to the standard of Heisel, it can go onto our platform. So that's how it works. Interesting. All right, yeah. now I'm, I'm going to ask you a few zingers now. Uh, so the, you know, obviously China's got some bad PR lately. Um, human rights stuff I mean not how has this affected the business uh, do you do you think and and I, I don't know maybe you're just not in the right position to to give me a good answer um, but has it been something that the PR people at Heisel have had to had to navigate a lot of damage control um, I'm probably not the best person to ask about this as I'm not on the ground. However, I would say not really, no. Um, okay. we, we haven't, we haven't. And um, okay. I haven't seen any, again, any negative effects or any kind of PR we've had to, we've had to manage as a direct result of that. No. Okay. Um, all right. I am interested, you told me before that the CEO of Heisel is a woman, correct? Yes, indeed. Yeah. That is really interesting. 100%. So how common is that for a big Chinese company? It's not very common at all, which makes Heisel stand out. Um, so she started it from, from scratch, from the ground oh, so up. So she's the founder too. Exactly. The founder. That's probably the, the only way a woman would be the seat. I don't know. So maybe I'm, maybe that's too much generalization, but. 
Yes, it's really special, very unique. She had an idea to bring manufacturing to the masses. Um, she saw a gap in the market to have a platform like Heisel, which is accessible to everybody, um, which is very user friendly, which has a really knowledgeable expert team behind it to help people source. Um, and well, so she built it from scratch up until what it is now. So do you know, like the, the personal story of it? Like, is there, is there sort of company lore that they tell everybody how, you know, what, how does this, how does this, how does a person, any, any person start a company like this in China from the ground up, but let alone what are the challenge, what would be the challenges for a woman to do that in China? Well, I think the challenges would be to highlight your USPs as opposed to, because if you search for, you know, sourcing platform China, so many come up, but they're not verified, they're not valid, they're not reputable. Oh, yeah. So I think that was probably um, to make yourself stand out and show why actually Heisel would make it as opposed to all the other companies would have been difficult. Plus, obviously, the fact that she is a woman. Um, and all the general challenges that come along with business. Um, Did she, she have a, was she like a business, um, you know, uh, had a, a business, uh, an MBA? Was she, did she come from manufacturing family? Do you, do you have any background on her? So um, I can't comment on the family background, um, to be honest with you. Um, however, Sherry did come from um, sourcing background so she was already knowledgeable within the industry very knowledgeable so she has years experience within this industry of manufacturing um, outsourcing so she had the knowledge behind her and she put it into use and then grew it some, um, bit by bit so you know she secured rounds of funding um, from huge companies um, and it's grown from strength to strength from there um, word of mouth as I said was was really key and um, we had some big buyers. Um, a lot of people use Heisel because they, you know, they sign an NDA. We don't disclose who, who a lot of our buyers are because, you know, they like their privacy. Sure. Um, but this is, Heisel is very, very well established in the market now. And that's all because of the good customer service that we offer, I guess, and good okay. products. Okay. Um yeah, and I'm, I'm stereotyping now, but I feel like uh, sometimes women owned companies uh, employ, they're, they're more open to employing other women. I guess my question is, uh, are there more women working at Heisel than at a typical um, big Chinese corporation? Um, well, nowadays, China is, uh, you know, there's, there's women in top leadership in a variety of positions, a variety of companies. So, um, however, Heisel does have a large proportion of women in upper management, but there is a mix. So we have we have men and women. And I think that balance is really important and also makes Heisel stand out because, you know, you have that you have that balance of um, creativity, of drive, of like, difference of opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of the reasons why Heisel has done so well in comparison to, to the other companies. Um, so you and, have you some know, competitors like it in China? Of course. Yeah. We, we, have, we, we have competitors, yes. But none have grown at the rate Heisel has. And, you know, there's a reason okay. for that. And that is because Heisel value, the, the, the customer is always number one with us. So our in-house everybody engineers, say, Everybody says that. But I mean, you know, so okay. the, the difference is the differences with Heisel, I guess, is the account manager really focuses on what your needs are as a customer and adapts completely to mm -hmm. you. How often um, can you talk to him on the phone or her on the phone? Well, obviously, bearing in mind the time difference and sure. during their sleep, they're not available. But essentially, they're available. No one's given too many accounts that they can't devote attention to them. So given the time difference, um, you have a lot of time. You can email them, you have a direct line for them um, and they respond, you know, the same day they will respond to you. So it's very easy, it's super easy. And they're such a great team, um, pleasure okay. to, to work with. So I think this makes Heisel stand out for me personally as well. Okay, uh, just a couple more questions, a little bit more about you. Um, of course, yeah. So, you lived in China working for Heisel for a long time, correct? 
Yes, so I moved to China in 2013, the beginning of 2013. So um, most of my 20s if it was spent in China. Um, was it, was, did you work there, work at Heisel the whole time or other so places? No, I've worked, I've worked at two big companies, Heisel being one of them. So I've been started at Heisel around ooh, five years, four years ago four years ago mm -hmm. so my background is also my background is marketing okay. um but also in manufacturing so the company i worked at prior to hyazol was also in manufacturing um however very different to metal and plastic um but a, a great experience all in shanghai so shanghai is just an amazing city to live and work in to be honest where were you I living feel? in at where when you were at hyazol shanghai as well Exactly. Yes. Shanghai. So our headquarters are actually in Shanghai. What so made you want to go? What made you want to go to China to work? I mean, it's super cool, but what were your parents like, you know, are, are you mental? I, I love using these British <laughs> phrases that I've learned from um, Harry Potter. And Yes. I've always been very fond of traveling. I had actually been to China before, um, not for work uh, through university. So I'd already experienced, you know, China and I just loved it and I got a job opportunity so I thought why not um but you were looking think, you were like oh, I think China would be a pretty cool place to look actually gonna... at the time I wasn't looking um I was quite settled in London and um I got an opportunity an opportunity came my way and I decided to take it um I think that life is all about that and I think that you know, the journey I had is, 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 is amazing. And, um, you've got to take up these opportunities and it allows you to see different parts of the world, experience different work cultures. Sure. So, um, I absolutely loved it and, uh, I didn't, I haven't looked back since. So now I am based in the UK, but I could highly recommend China to somebody who wants, um, a work experience or not even China, but if, you know, you want just an experience to work abroad, go for it. Absolutely yeah. go for it. So that's what I would. Um, no, it's life-changing because then you, yeah. you, I mean, I lived in Italy for, for a little while and, but it's, and that was significant, but it's nothing like going to, to Asia. I'm sure. I mean, I've gone to Japan a few times and it's, I mean, it's like you're, you're, you're on another planet and I'm sure China is like that as well in its own way. Um, was it strange to come back, to settle back in? You you came more because of the pandemic. That was what got you back. Yeah. So I guess it's different. It was different times, wasn't it? Since the pandemic, so um, it's hard to come. It was a, it was a big life change. Um, but mostly that was probably because of the pandemic. To be honest, you know, lockdown and everything. And you see, so you when came China back was when you came back when mid nine so mid two thousand when when twenty you came, mid two thousand end of twenty twenty. Right. So it really hadn't reached the rest of the world, but China had already started locking down. Well, this is it. So the interesting thing is, China. When China were recovering, the rest of the world was being hit harder. So as China went into lockdown, the rest of the world had. COVID hadn't hit yet. Um, and none of us, I guess, expected it to travel across the world. We thought it would be contained to China and it would pass. But um, weren't we idiots? Yeah. So I never thought for a second, you know, I thought it was an issue we had on the ground in China that, you know, after lockdown, it would all be back to normal again, but it hasn't been back to normal. So it's a bit difficult to answer because obviously, you know, moving across the world during COVID um and we're only just starting to if we can call it normal yeah i mean we i'm based in the uk we've only just relaxed whenever whenever we relax and think things are getting back to normal then it's like well exactly no exactly we've only just relaxed our policies now and um who knows what's did, did what's you feel like help. when you came back did you feel like I'm escaping. I'm escaping the virus. I'm safe now. And then all of a sudden you're like, wah, wah. <laughs> no. So when I came back, there was COVID had spread, but it wasn't um, as, as bad as it got in 2021. Um, I didn't really think, think, think too much of it. Um, I never thought it would be what, what it turned into. Um, what did it feel in. like? What did it feel like to be on lockdown over there versus 
in in the UK? Really different. So in China, I would say that it's very strict. You know, when they say lockdown, they mean lockdown. Um, so what is that? What what does that mean? You can't leave your door. No. Well, it depends what time it was. So when it was ki- when COVID first hit, which I think was we first went into lockdown. If my memory serves me correctly, it was around February 2020, and um, we weren't. We, there was guards on the on our compound door. We couldn't. We couldn't physically leave. Um, and if you go into quarantine, well, you were living um, in you were living in a compound for like four years. Yeah, so no not foreigners so shanghai is kind of like london it's a lot of flats and high-rise buildings so if you're in the center or anywhere close to the city it's unlikely that you're in a house it's more likely you're in a comp i call it compound a a flat in 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 a compounded area so this is what shanghai is made of okay when we think of compounds in the united states we think of like there's only a few we think of like a huge building or like like a walled area or something Uh uh-huh so no it's not it's not all right like um it's separate from the rest of the like it's a gated or something yeah it's, it's not it's not like that but it is a compound as such because it's a compound with a collection of flats within it so and then the gate can be locked at night or you know there's different kinds of compounds um okay but this is very common but it's not so it's like an of... apartment complex and then it's there's a, sort a, of a surrounding gate sometimes it depends i mean you know there's different ones there's ones with gates that you can push to open with a buzzer there's ones that are not gated at all you know there's a whole range to be honest with you but this is the most common form of accommodation um it's very rare that you're in you're in a house or a small sure. flat building um, so they and they were just like you can't leave this your gate yeah yeah so lockdown meant lockdown and then there was a time where it was eased off a bit so you could go to the shops um but that's what it needed you know we needed to stop the spread so if you've got rules but nobody's following them you're not going to stop the spread so i think you know it was all right positive actions from the government and very quickly and people are good um, at following rules over there yeah and the rules are implemented very very fast So, you know, one day you're in the office, next you're not, and you don't. But I mean, somebody working in manufacturing and, you know, uh, on a a large scale, what was the first thought that came to your mind? And then maybe the second thought after a few weeks, like, I mean, your, your, your brain just must must have been racing of different, different ideas. What's going to go on now? Oh, what's going on now? Yeah, I mean, it was different from day to day, to be honest. And I personally just kept thinking that it's going to be over soon. I didn't think. Well, so it did would, everybody. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I downplayed it probably, to be honest, because we were really fast with responding. I thought, OK, this, the spread will stop because we're all in lockdown and um, the government dealt with it so well in China, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um I I didn't think it would last as long as it did and to be fair China did curb it quite quickly but by then unfortunately it had already spread um sure very interesting this is this is a lot of a lot of uh stuff to chew on um seeing if I if I missed anything uh you know just one question I, I like to ask people just about everybody I interview, I I ask them, um, you know, what's something you learned last week? Um, But then they kind of go, some people come up with something clever and then a lot of people go, shit, I don't know what I learned. So so I've changed Um, the question. Okay. The question that I've started asking people is, what's something that you read recently or heard recently um, that you know, sort of left uh, even an, an emotional um, impression on you. Oh, that's a tough one. I mean, it's not that tough. Okay, well, it's just something interesting then. It, it doesn't have to be like like that dramatic, but something. Wow, this was cool. I learned this on a podcast, or I read this in a book, or I saw this on a TV show. Um, let me have a think.
Don't worry, we'll edit the pause a little. It'll be it'll be shorter. I'm literally trying to think about something interesting. So I will tell, yes, okay. I'd say something interesting that I learned is that, so close to where I live, there's a shelter for the homeless. Mm -hmm. And um, I learned that, you know, having chatted with a couple of them, um, this is very random, but this is last week. So um, that, you know, some people like to, to be off the grid. Something that made me think is, you know, we're so caught up in, social media and being digital and online um not for business but you know when we're not doing business we spend our lives looking what other people are doing and he actually purposely made himself decided to be homeless because he didn't want to be on this grid anymore and he just wanted to kind of take a step back and enjoy life for what it is day by day and there was something kind of and he needed to be that. he needed to be homeless to do that you you were just talking to him and that's what he said yeah, he basically said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's the reason he, he lost his house or what, whatever his situation was before. But the point he was making was, you know, normal life. He, he wasn't enjoying the fact that, you know, we're so concerned with, with, with social and being digital. And it can sometimes be fake, can't it? Excuse sometimes. Me, there's something, yeah, exactly. He said there's something beautiful about just living living in in the in the world mm. and in the moment and he said you know he doesn't have um, an id he doesn't have a passport he's not a number or he's not a name he's he's himself and just that was really cash. interesting yeah yeah that, is that interesting. was really mm. very cool so that was food for thought yes yeah yeah well i thank you so much glad thank we were you. finally glad pleasure. we were finally able to figure it out